Allison, in trying to understand the scientific method and why science is important in today's world, philosophy of science really studies the in-depth approach to it. You, you have a radically different approach and, and want to understand philosophy of science in the crib. Your yeah. book, The Philosophical Baby, is a, a radically different way of thinking. So help me understand how a baby can help us elucidate what science is all about. Well, there's this really fundamental puzzle in the philosophy of science, which is that we've only been doing science for a couple of hundred years uh, in a formal way, the kind of thing that philosophy of science does. But of course, we're using brains to do that that are exactly the same brains that we evolved back in the Pleistocene. So it's a real puzzle. Why is it that our human brains are so good at doing things like finding out about quarks and mm. distant planets and mm. the theory of relativity? Um, when they've only been doing that for this tiny little recent sl uh, sliver of time. And the answer that I've argued for for several years about this is that when we actually look at babies and young children, we see implicitly a lot of the same kinds of processes that we see in science. So when we look at how children develop, what we've discovered is that what they're doing is testing hypotheses, doing experiments, making even making inferences inferences from statistics in extremely sophisticated ways. And in fact, I collaborated with the philosopher of science, Clark Gleamore, and he's tried to work out computational algorithms for how you could actually do science, how could you do discovery. Mm. And these kinds of machine learning methods for doing science have become very influential. In fact, lots of things like figuring out gene expression actually it now involves putting data into these algorithms and then letting the algorithms figure out the underlying causal structure from the data. So my idea was maybe we could show that children, at least implicitly if not consciously, are using the same kinds of algorithms, the same kinds of computations that say we might build into a Mars robot to let it do some science while it's up there on Mars. And I, I like that example because the Mars robots kind of look like four-year-olds. They, my, my friends who control them say it's kind of like living with a four-year-old. They tip over and you have to pick them up and they're always getting into things and doing the wrong things. Um, so what we've done is we've had an experimental research program where we've given children evidence about a particular system, say just a box that lights up when you put things on it. And we can give them patterns, statistical patterns, contingency patterns. And then we can just get them to tell us what they've, inferences they've made by saying things like, well, make the box, make the box go, or tell me which of these blocks will make it go. Um, and we can ask that about people too. So we can give people, we can tell the children things like, look, here's Marion. She won't go on the sliding board. And here's um, John, and he does sometimes, but not other times. Now, what will they do if they have to go in the swimming pool? Or which one of them is brave and which one of them isn't? And, and explain why it is that they're doing that. So we can take either physical or, or psychological cases, and we can ask children about them. And what we've discovered is that as young as we can test, the children are using these very powerful methods for testing hypotheses, relating them to data, they do experiments, except that we call it getting into everything. Mm -hmm. And recent studies have shown that when they get into everything, when they play, they really do it in a very systematic kind of way that lets them get more uh, of the right kind of evidence. So what all that suggests is, you know, my slogan is that it's not that children are little scientists. It's actually that scientists are big children. So my argument is that we have these really powerful inferential capacities, which were designed by evolution for us to use in this long extended, unusually long childhood that we have as human mm. beings. Let us do all of this extended learning. And a few of us, at particular historical times, are privileged to actually be like children. We don't actually have to work for a living, and we don't have to do anything useful, and we don't have to worry mm. about reproduction and survival. For many, many years, we were taken care of by women who actually took care of all of our everyday <laughs> needs. And in that context, even as adults, we can do some of the same kinds of science, the same kinds of learning. But really, I think what we're doing is we're using uh, uh, cognitive capacities that were designed to be used by very young children to do all of the mm. kind of learning about the environment that they have to learn. They're really evolved for use by by children. What, what's a specific uh, experiment with young children that shows this inferential pattern of, uh, of uh, inferring from data a, a statistical pattern and then coming up with a, a hypothesis? Well, here's an example of one that we just did with 24-month-olds. So what we did is that we have um, uh, 
box that lights up when you put some things on it, but not others. And what the 24 month olds see is that if you put a red block on the box, then it will light up two out of six times. And if you put a blue block on the, on the box, it will light up two out of three times. So sometimes it lights up two times and doesn't light up once, and then with the other block, it mm. lights up two out of six times. Now, if you were a statistician, what you'd say is, oh, okay, well, there's a higher probability that the, I guess I said the blue block is making it go, the two out of three block has a higher probability of activating it than the two out of six block does. Well, we can ask 24-month-olds that by simply showing them this evidence and then saying to them, make the machine go. And the question is, do they choose the high probability block or do they choose the low probability block? And notice that they're seeing the same number of times that it activates. They have to actually kind of do the probability computation to figure this out. 24-month-olds can do this. They're well above chance. Even though they can't do arithmetic at that, that point. They can't do arithmetic. They can't count. I mean, 24 months yeah. is, you know, yeah. basically just having learned how to walk and talk, barely right. two-year-olds. Right. Um, and yet, they can make this inference from, uh, they can make this inference from probabilistic data. There's other kinds of experiments that show that children can understand the relationship between a sample and a distribution. So they, uh, for example, in work that my colleague Fei Shu has done, and he, work that she did in collaboration with Tamar Kushner, they wanted to see if children could use statistics to figure out what's going on in other people's heads, what they want. So they set up an experiment where the children see someone taking, uh, they see a, a box full of either mostly frogs or mostly ducks, little toys. And they see an experimenter who, for example, takes four frogs out of a bowl that's almost all frogs. And then they see an experimenter take four frogs out of a bowl that's almost all ducks. Well, if you take just frogs out of a box of ducks, that's a non-random sample. Um, whereas if you take just frogs from a box of frogs, well, what else could you do, right? So taking frogs from a box of ducks is kind of like what a statistician would say, wait a minute, there's a less than 0.05 probability that that happened by chance. That's not just a random event. It must indicate something causal. And in fact, what it indicates is I like ducks better than frogs. So they showed the children 20-month-olds now these patterns. And then they simply, the experimenter put out her hand and said, can you give me one? Now the question is, what will they give her? Well, it turns out that if she's taken frogs for mostly frogs, they are equally likely to give her frogs or ducks. But if she's taken frogs for mostly ducks, then they just give her frogs. So they seem to have said, okay, she took frogs for mostly ducks. That's a non-random sample. That must indicate something causal going on in her mind, namely that she likes frogs. <laughs> so since I'm a good little child, I'm going to give her the frogs what instead of the ducks. So, you know, again, this is 20-month-olds, and they're understanding this really sophisticated kind of statistical idea. So now jump to philosophy of science. What can you infer from that remarkable data of what is obviously innate right. uh, to our capacity to do science? So the fact that we see these capacities for things like hypothesis testing and causal inference in place at such... Uh, uh, an early age um, suggests that a, a way of thinking about what we do as scientists is, of course, as children are doing, the children are doing this implicitly and unconsciously. And as scientists, at least some of the time, we're thoughtful and reflective about what we're doing. And we can, for instance, say, well, wait a minute, that actually wasn't the right kind of statistical inference to make. Or we can end up believing in something like quantum mechanics where our basic assumptions about causality all fall apart. Um, and we can do things like explicitly use mathematics and formalism. So there's lots of things that we do as scientists that we don't do as children. But I think fundamentally the reason why science is convincing, and not just convincing to scientists but convincing to everyone else, is because it's rooted in techniques for finding out about the world which are themselves rooted in an evolutionary history. So people often ask, well, what's the justification for science? Is it just that, you know, some scientists are bullying other scientists and they're powerful and elite mm -hmm. and telling people that what they say is true? Why is it that we get convinced by scientific examples, even if we're not scientists? And what I would argue is that we have these very basic capacities for detecting the truth, which evolved to let us detect the truth, and particularly to let children detect the truth um, in very powerful ways, which in turn enabled us to function better in our evolutionary history. And really, we're tuning into those very basic abilities to detect the truth when we 
agree with scientists or when we pay attention to what scientists do or when science actually genuine that that's a reason for thinking that what science is doing is really getting us to the truth and it isn't just a particular strange social enterprise that some of us engage in